It's surprising to me that no one's talking about the two real reasons tech hiring is struggling because despite what the NVIDIA CEO is telling you, don't even learn to code anymore because you could just use our GPUs and write everything with AI. That's not a reality yet because GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT, they have a hard time closing parentheses for now, let alone editing a code base and understanding it a million lines and being able to reliably make changes that actually work so we're a long way off from that and that is not currently at least driving the tech hiring downturn which has been going on for quite a while now so the things that most people aren't talking about which are the clear economic drivers of this which if they're reversed can overnight really turn things around are number one the end of zerp or the zero interest rate phenomenon and number two something barely anyone even knows about which is section 174, the change to the tax code. Now we're gonna get into both of these because if you're trying to break into the industry, if you're deciding whether it's worth it to still learn, then it's really important to have your eye on these two things because again, if they change, it can have an overnight surge back to hiring. And in fact, we'll talk about the AI thing a bit more, but we do have reason to believe that if anything, that's gonna expand the tech industry. And while each developer will of course become more productive, as they already have. This may actually change the nature of what coding jobs are to an extent, but doesn't necessarily mean that software engineering jobs are gonna be eliminated. They're just gonna be slightly altered in the way that new programming languages, new frameworks and paradigms have made people more productive in the past. So let's start by quickly touching on ZERP. Interest rates were near zero for a long time. So the cost of capital was very cheap. It was basically free to borrow money with debt. And your risk-free return that is with treasury bonds and similar was basically zero. So that combination led to people making slightly more risky equity style investments, namely venture capital, which drives a huge part of the tech industry. This is the big reason salaries in the US are much higher than other countries when it comes to software engineering, software developer salaries, because the industry is basically inflated by all this money flowing into it. Now, when there's less overall money coming in, of course, that's less of a budget for spending on developers, reinvesting and similar. And more of that money is flowing to the risk-free investments because when you do the calculation on return, you of course have to factor in the risk and we can get mathematical about it but that is the high level overview and this has been well documented across history where lower interest rates basically mean that certain industries get inflated now the cause of this of course inflation was high the rates went up to combat that and therefore you know it has this downstream impact however this is not a permanent state of things ideally speaking if things were to return to their let's say last 30 years average then that that trend could be reversed. Now, the other economic pressure is the Section 174 tax law. Now, just to briefly cover it, basically, there was a change to the tax code where software engineering uh, salaries and any investment into software development is now counted as R&D that has to be amortized. Now, what this means is even as crazy as it sounds, developer salaries, you cannot deduct them as a tax expense. So if you're a startup and you want to hire one one developer at 100k a year and you make 100k profit in the past you could fully deduct that salary meaning you'd have zero profit for that year and pay zero taxes however under section 174 you have to deduct that salary over five years so you can only deduct 20k in year one meaning you have to pay tax on the remaining 80k in that first year therefore let's say your tax rate is 40 percent on that 80k you have to pay around 33,000 of taxes, meaning now you would have a loss of 33K rather than a break even profit. So, of course, you can deduct it in the following years. However, that's very difficult as a startup. And it's even difficult as a larger company, though there can be certain, you know, tax benefits to this style of amortization. It puts a lot of short term pressure on how much you can actually spend. All this 
is to say that this is an additional pressure driver on the industry at large because now you have to think long term and really second guess how you're reinvesting your profits and your revenue because there are more tax implications. So this is particularly devastating to startups. However, it again puts that pressure on the entire industry where now a software developer in the short term is much more expensive from an overall cost standpoint. You might be thinking, okay, companies are just going to go overseas. However, for overseas development work, you have to amortize it over 10 years. So it gets even worse. There is a a movement, let's say, to repeal or edit this nonsensical new legislation that went into effect right around when the tech layoffs started. That was tax year 2022. So people are moving to repeal it, to change it, because the implications are pretty devastating. However, that still hasn't happened. So if we cross our fingers, keep an eye on it, this could also relieve some of that pressure on the industry, bring back a surge of hiring and similar. So what exactly do you do at this point? Because of course, these two things seem pretty bad. You could just look at the AI stuff, completely give up. However, at this stage, I don't think that's a great idea still. Number one, because what's really your alternative? AI is putting pressure on every industry. And while yes, software development, breaking into the industry before was almost too good to be true, where you could just not have a degree, teach yourself, and then break in and be earning 100K, it's still good. It's still possible. However, yes, in the current state of things, it is a bit harder. That is also affecting the supply side though, people's sentiments around it have changed. Bootcamp admissions and signups have gone down. So if you're kind of willing to go against the crowd at this point, if you're willing to bet on the recovery and still learning now, you could be in a very good position in the near future for breaking in once things do recover, which I do think will happen. Now, before we talk about AI, there is simply one thing that I have to be blunt about. Now, more than ever, when you get those interview opportunities, if you're you're spending all that time applying when you get your shot you cannot waste it rather than casually doing leak code programs and watching videos on youtube i do think it's a great idea to do something a little bit more serious and comprehensive like interview prep by interview kickstart this is a multi-month program that will really take you through each step that's needed to ace the interviews they are the top market leader in the u.s for tech interview prep the platform is developed by FANG level software engineers, hiring managers, and similar. And they have a large team of mentors and instructors from FANG companies that are gonna help you out personally. With over 20,000 students and great reviews, this is the highest probability way to make sure you don't miss your shot and that you're fully prepared. So take a minute, check out Interview Kickstart, see if it looks great for you, and they're gonna make sure that you get the result you want, or you're gonna get half your money back. So check out the link, and now let's continue on talking about the industry, specifically AI. Let's talk a little bit about AI, which I really fully believe it will continue to improve. It will, let's say, help developers catch their errors as they're going, but it's more to the degree of 2x in the right hands. Maybe it'll speed up your work by 50%. That human element is still required. The way I'm thinking about it too is there's sort of an asymptote line for AI productivity within coding. What you see even in the image and video generation is it's like 90 to 95 percent perfect but there's always a few things wrong and it's the same with text generation llms there will be one or two things off and as suitable as ai is for code generation that missing five percent which i think is going to be very hard to get you know that last five percent actually perfect which is what we've seen so far that's a big issue with coding because if one line doesn't compile if one line doesn't work then the whole thing breaks. So you can't just be generating code without understanding it because then you can't debug things that are wrong. You can't identify them. In a perfect world, the AI would be reading your entire, you know, 100,000 line code base and you could just tell it, hey, I want to add this feature and it would go and do that. But as any 
developer working with AI now would tell you, number one, it can't do that at all. So you can't really feed it in a large input, even a full long file, it won't accept. And even if you could, it would probably have a few of those errors slash not really match your naming patterns or conventions, make certain things up. So you'd still have to go in and fix it, which could in the current state even take longer than just writing it yourself. So the ideal way to use it now is to maybe just generate a starter function, some boilerplate or complete a line where it's already very clear what you're going to write. However, for those larger tasks, it's still very manual. And the reality of working as a developer is most of it is editing code, is reading, understanding and changing things that are already written to fix bugs, make small changes and similar. That's the reality of how things work now. So with the AI not being able to understand code in the way that a human can, it is still a very long way from doing the majority of development work, especially when you're dealing with production code. If you're dealing with a, you know, fun sample project, completely different story, it can probably build something for you pretty quick. But especially within companies, legacy code bases, huge repositories, it's not really doing the heavy lifting for you. It's just doing a small subroutine. So that's my uh, assessment of the current state of AI. I would not at this point in time, listen to the NVIDIA CEO, other tech influencers saying, well, it's over stopping to make videos completely because of this. We're just not there yet. And once we do get there, hopefully you could already be in a position to take advantage of it where you're maybe already an established software engineer five, 10 years down the road. And then you already have that kind of credibility. You've mastered the meta programming aspects and you can just use it as a tool to ride the wave of the way software evolves. That's my analysis, not a doomer analysis, more a hopeful one. And I hope you've gained a bit of confidence from this video. Um, let me know what you think of these economic factors I mentioned. Of course, section 174 is crazy. Do you think this is purely driven by interest rates or do you think there's other factors I didn't really cover? Let me know in a comment what you think and I'll see you in the next video.